great. That's always the hardest part is remember to press the record button. Um, good morning. Um, thank you so much again for joining us on this seventh webinar in our series. You can see that there's a lot to say about telehealth, which is why we're seven in. Um, this is, I think, probably our most popular uh, series is because everyone always, always needs help thinking about consent, confidentiality, information sharing. So um, thank you for um, being one of the many people joining us this morning. Um, we, sorry, before we go into housekeeping, um, we created this series around telehealth based on needs that we heard from, uh-oh, um, Sierra, can you do some uh, help with Karen Field Blank, who is having trouble hearing? Um, Rebecca and Elizabeth, can you guys hear me? You want to give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. So I think it's just maybe Karen that's having a hard time. Oh, thank you, Karen. No, great. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. I was saying that we uh, created this series because we are hearing so much need from the school based health field to shift services to telehealth platforms. And there's so many different pieces of that. Uh, and so many different pieces to figure out. And so um, this is the seventh in an ongoing series. All of the other ones are on our website and recorded, and we have captured all the telehealth resources that we have found also on our website. And we have a very robust website around HIPAA, FERPA, and information sharing in general um, that is also on our website. So um, thank you for joining this really timely uh, webinar presentation today. Uh, and definitely look on our website for the rest of the materials as part of this. Um, uh, really quick business. Um, if you're having a hard time hearing, sometimes if it's still laggy or spotty and you're listening on the computer, it can be better to call in. So there's the phone number and the access code if you want to call in on your phone. Um, Sarah, she can post, Sarah can post that number. Um, on the chat in case we move forward and you don't have it, but if you are having a hard time hearing, that's a good way to try to solve that. Um, we are recording this webinar, so you can go to our website to see that, um, and the supporting materials will be shared. Um, someone had a question about how, two ways, um, you'll, but you'll see our website in just one second at schoolhealthcenters.org, but it will be up on the slides, and we will send it out as a follow-up email. Um, so we are there on that website, as promised, schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, we are the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, we are a statewide nonprofit dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Um, we do this a lot of different ways. Some of those are workshop and webinars like today. Some of those are individual technical assistance that we do with um, particular organizations or, or schools capacity building, advocacy. We have a whole um, policy and advocacy department. Um, and we have a conference every year. Um, this is our first year of going virtual, so we're really excited about that. Um, I think it'll make uh, it possible for a lot more people to attend because, you know, as always, you won't have to leave your home to go. Um, and it's a lot more affordable. So um, it is October 6th, 7th, and 8th, and that is on our website. It's a Tuesday through Thursday. Um, there's going to be lots of amazing workshops, including Rebecca and I think Elizabeth as well. So if you want more of this amazing content, plus so, so, so much more, um, check that out. Uh, registration is really affordable. I think it's $75 if you are not a member of your agency or, or individual or not a member, and $25 if you are a member, which leads me to this slide, which is um, we encourage everyone as an organization to become a member of the organization. This is part of how we support the work that we're able to offer to you. And so if your organization isn't already one, please reach out um, and do that and we can tell you if you don't. Um, and then who are we? So I introduced our organization. I introduced myself. My name is Amy Ranger and I'm the director of programs. Um, I have worked in school-based health centers for almost 20 years um, and have been at DSHA uh, for over three. So I'm really delighted um, to be part of this work and to be here with you all today. Um, we also have two amazing speakers that we've worked really closely with over, over the years and feel so grateful to. Uh, Rebecca Gudeman is the Senior Director of Health at the National Center for Youth Law. She's the author of numerous articles and papers on consent and confidentiality law, including the California HIPAA FERPA primer, um, and which is, um, uh, there's a website, uh, and Yes, sorry, I'm distracted by the Q&A. I'm going to stop looking at it until the end. Um, 
the, the virtual version of Rebecca's primer is on our website. So if you go to schoolhealthcenters.org and then look at for HIPAA or FERPA or confidentiality or consent, you will find her brilliant primer um, that Elizabeth contributed to as well on our website, as well as the downloadable PDF if you're someone who likes to read things, as I am. Sometimes it's nicer just to print it out and look through it. Um, Elizabeth Estes is our other attorney today. She represents school districts and county offices of education throughout the state. She's an attorney with Atkinson, Andelson, Boya, Red, and Romo, as well as the founder of Breaking Barriers, which is a statewide interagency initiative aimed at collaboratively breaking current systematic barriers to social, emotional, and behavioral health for California's children. So if you um, are in this world of school mental health and you don't know about Breaking Barriers, definitely look them up because they're doing amazing work. And so a huge, huge thank you to Rebecca and Elizabeth for joining us today. Also, a really big thank you to Anthem, who's sponsoring um, this webinar, as well as some upcoming webinars. Um, so thank you to them for making this possible. Um, and let me see if I have anything else I need to tell you before I turn it over. Um, please stick around. We will have time for question and answers at the end. Um, and um, there will be a really brief evaluation at the end that gets sent to you automatically. So appreciations for that. And if you can stay to the end, that's great. And then there was one other question. Oh, slides will be made available both on the website and emailed out um, the, the recording. So thank you so much. And I will pass the facilitation over to um, Rebecca. Amy. Um, and while we're waiting for Amy to hand me the baton so I can move the slides, I'll just take a second to say thank you. And I always appreciate an opportunity to partner with the fab fabulous Elizabeth on these. Um, uh, it's really nice to have someone who represents school districts, and I am more familiar with sort of the health provider side, so you're, you're getting a good um, uh, well-rounded uh, presentation today. I will remind folks, even though we're both lawyers, we cannot provide legal advice, just legal information. So just warning you up front for some questions, you may hear us say something like that. So I apologize, but that's that, um, that may come out of my mouth. <laughs> um, so uh, just Telehealth's been around for a while, but obviously with COVID and shelter in place, we really are digging in in a way we never have before into some of the technical and practical and clinical um, skills and strategies and rules. Um, and so today's webinar is primarily on some of the uh, technical and legal rules around uh, consent and confidentiality. Um, even though we're all using the term telehealth and telehealth services, I think it's helpful to remind folks there's actually a definition in our state law for what incorporates uh, what telehealth is. So just to sort of ground us all in the same place, what our state law says is that telehealth is a mode of delivering healthcare services and public health via information and communication technologies to facilitate the diagnosis, consultation, treatment, education, care management, and self-management of a patient's health care while the patient is at the originating site and the health care provider is at the distant site. In other words, they're in two different geographic physical locations. Um, note, this is quite broad. It covers public health, it covers mental health, it covers behavioral health, as well as physical health care. Um, but when we refer to telehealth today, this is sort of the definition that we are uh, working with. Um, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about consent rules and then jump into confidentiality, including some of the um, frequently asked questions and that we have heard so far in terms of applying these um, in a telehealth context. Um, and then we're going to open it up uh, for your questions and hopefully have some good conversation. Um, so to start, let's look at consent. Um, just again, to ground us, a lot of times we use the word consent to mean many different things, including consent to release information. Um, so what I want to do is walk through three different um, in, kinds of consent that are distinct, but sometimes blur together when we're in the process of getting permission to provide healthcare services. So that's consent to treatment, consent to use telehealth technology, and consent related to insurance billing. And I'll talk about each of those in turn. 
Um, so when we're talking about consent for treatment, we're talking about the permission to engage in that healthcare service. Um, that if we didn't have technically um, you're uh, engaging in that health care could be considered an assault. So we're getting permission to engage in a service with somebody. Um, and as a quick reminder, when we're providing services to a minor, the general rule is that we need a parent or guardian to consent for that care. But there are, of course, many exceptions that allow other adults to consent in some circumstances and that allow minors to consent for their own health care. Um, we won't go through all of those, but just a, a reminder that we have a number of um, charts available on uh, the website teenhealthlaw.org that summarize both minor consent law as well as some of the rules that allow other, uh, others to consent on behalf of a minor in, in different contexts. So you can take a look at those. Um, you know, for, for some folks, the, the basic question is, well, when we do our consent for treatment rules change when we're providing telehealth services? And the answer is no. Our state law specifically says that all laws governing um, standards of practice that would apply when you're providing services in the same physical room also apply when you're providing telehealth. So all the consent to treatment rules in terms of who consents for that initial engagement apply in the same way when you're doing telehealth services. Um, so what about consent for telehealth? Well, state law usually does require you to get explicit consent to use telehealth in order to provide services. What our state law says is that before you can deliver healthcare via telehealth, the provider who is using telehealth must both inform a patient of, that they're going to use telehealth and then obtain verbal or written consent. And then if you do uh, ob obtain verbal consent, have some way to document that consent. Um, and that has been part of our state law for quite a while. Um, however, back in April, um, Governor Newsom did issue an executive order that relaxed a number of the state law requirements around delivery of telehealth in order to facilitate delivery of telehealth services during the pandemic and during the state of emergency. And among other uh, rules that were suspended or waived was the requirement that a health care provider obtain verbal or written consent for use of telehealth services and also waive the requirement to document that consent. So while we are still in a state of emergency, um, that is no longer legally required in terms of what's required by our state law. Um, so what does that mean for you all in terms of practice? Do you need to get a separate consent in order to provide telehealth services? Um, we know that the state law no longer is in place, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're off the hook. It's also important to look at what any professional guidance might say and what your agency or your district uh, says. Um, and so I'm going to pass it to Elizabeth to talk a little bit about some examples of what is out there currently in terms of guidance and uh, practice. Yeah, so we, um, in working with the, and represent a number of the public school districts in California, the services are being provided um, to students in the school through the district. Um, we do recommend that that we have consent, uh, a notice of the fact that telehealth will be utilized and sort of all of the confines of what that looks like um, and limitations of what that looks like for service delivery and also some of the issues related to privacy um, that we can't address um, in a remote environment as well as we can in a in a room one to one with a student um, in a school setting. So if and also if you look at the guidance that's come out of like the California Association of School Psychologists or CDE, um, there are recommendations for notice of both utilization of telehealth and then some sort of um, consent to uh, receipt of that notice and to the service that's being offered. And I would just add that while the governor did suspend that state law, federal laws are still in place, like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act for students and so, and ADA for students and Section 504 for students. And so there are a myriad of laws that are at play here when you're providing services to students um,
in a school setting and also uh, they have multiple entitlements governed by both state and fed, multiple state and federal laws. So in order to address all of those, we do recommend um, that there is consent to telehealth and a notice of, of what that means. And we've, we've worked with a number of school districts to develop that. And that's why we really recommend that you work with your agency to confirm what the good practice is, because not everyone will be subject to ADA, not everyone will be subject to 504, but your agency counsel can help figure out uh, what the best strategy is if that's uh, potentially implicated. Um, I would say one of the most important things is to just understand what the process is that you're to be utilizing out in the field um, in any given school district, if you're working with a school district, um, that would be really critical. And I know that there also were questions. Um, it is important to remind you that the executive order waiving the state law is only in effect until the state of emergency um, uh, is uh, it, while we're in a state of emergency. So the second that that changes, we're back to the old rules. And that's another reason why some folks are still recommending just get that consent up front so that you have that in place and don't need to keep circling back. Um, when and if things change, or I shouldn't say if things change, they will change. We don't know when they'll change, but um, uh, it, it, depending on, it just uh, keeps things uh, cleaner uh, for folks. Um, the other thing, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we did want to flag that for certain insurance programs, there is a, a requirement to get consent um, for telehealth, providing telehealth services if you plan to build that insurance. So for example, some of the Medi-Cal programs do have some separate rules that require confirming that you um, obtained consent uh, to use telehealth if you plan to build Medi-Cal. Now, many Medi-Cal rules have been changed and waived um, or suspended while we're in this state of emergency, but in the same way, your agency may um, encourage you to go ahead and get that consent, even if it's not required today, because we don't know when that may change. Um, so it's another thing if you, particularly if you bill a lot of Medi-Cal and public insurance programs, it's really valuable to make sure that um, you're checking in with your agency about uh, what practices are currently um, in place and what is currently required um, for you all to actually be able to get paid for whatever services you're providing. Um, okay, so we're going to shift to confidentiality now. Um, one of the, uh, in order to talk about that, it's important to know whether and to talk about the rules that may be in place for releases of information um, or technology requirements, you need to know whether your records and your information are subject to HIPAA or if they're subject to FIPA. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. That's its own. Um, webinar, and in fact, that is something that we'll be doing at the conference, but just to um, give you sort of a grounding and point you in the right direction, um, as a general matter, if you are a standalone county or community health agency, typically your records are subject to um, HIPAA. Um, if you are a school employee, in general, your records would be subject to FERPA. Um, and as soon as we start to mix those and get into hybrid situation, it really requires um, individual case by case sort of looking at the variables at play. Um, it is not possible to operate under both FERPA and HIPAA at the same time. Um, HIPAA regulations explicitly state that if um, FERPA applies to a record, then HIPAA does not apply. So you can't be both. Um, one of the key questions in deciding whether the records you're talking about are subject to HIPAA or FERPA is starting with the question, is the originating health provider an educational agency employee or agent of one? So, for example, a school nurse, if the school nurse is an originating health provider, um, that's an educational agency employee, the, the school nurse's records are, are most likely subject to FERPA. Um, but it, it does require case-by-case -case assessment, and there are other variables that, um, that we would look at, such as the services and functions being provided, 
um, operational and administrative control over the health services, um, financing. Um, a lot of folks say, oh my gosh, this sounds really hard. Can't we just sort of sign a contract or an MOU and say we're HIPAA or FERPA? Um, no, unfortunately, because we're talking about uh, federal regulations and laws, we can't just waive those um, and, and by contract. So it does require going through that process. If your agency hasn't done that um, in order to, to confirm sort of which set of rules you're operating under, this is a great time to do that. Um, it does have implications not only for telehealth, but in a lot of other areas. We won't go through all of them right now, but they're in the slide. Um, we mentioned the HIPAA FERPA primer up front. We do have that on paper, and it does provide some more guidance on how you figure this out. And as Amy said, now the contents of that primer are now up on a fabulous interactive uh, website, uh, web page within the California School-Based Health Alliance's uh, website. So I encourage you to take a look at that. You can like click on the different avatars to look for at sort of the questions and, and figure out um, sort of what are, what are additional information you need to make that HIPAA or FERPA determination. Um, and we will be talking about that more at the conference this fall. Um, so let's just uh, presume that everyone is moving forward and, and pretty solidly understands whether their records are HIPAA or whether their records are FERPA. We'll talk first about- Can I just, can yeah. I just say one thing? Absolutely. One of the challenges that I have seen in the field um, over the past 10 years of working on these issues of HIPAA and FERPA is a lack of any discussion about whether service delivery is going to be HIPAA or FERPA governed um, if we have a partnership between school providers and other providers. And then there's a contract that's executed that says we're all going to comply with HIPAA and FERPA, but nobody really knows whether you're HIPAA or FERPA governed, which as Rebecca just said, uh, controls uh, answers to other questions um, with relation to the maintenance of those records and releases and all of that. So, it is really important that up front, um, when you're deciding to provide services, uh, that you understand the answer to that question. And if there's anyone in the field who doesn't understand the answer to that question as they sit here today, um, it's a question that you want to get answered. Yeah. Pick one. Um, okay, so for those whose records would be subject to HIPAA, we're now going to walk through some of the uh, sort of the basic rules that help set us up to discuss telehealth questions. Um, so just as a reminder, HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It is um, federal regulations, and what HIPAA says is that it's sort of setting a ground floor in terms of rules related to privacy and security of records, but it also acknowledges that if your state has any state laws that also address these issues and provide greater protection, then you should follow your state laws. Um, so California is one of the states that does have um, some more detailed and protective state laws in place. Um, so even though we're talking about HIPAA, um, oftentimes, when we're talking about HIPAA, we're talking about HIPAA and our state law. And I just wanted to flag that. We go more into that in the HIPAA FERPA primer, but it is important to know that what we do in California may look different than what your colleagues are doing in another state because their state law may not be the same as uh, California. So following a model or copying the um, practices of another school-based health entity or a health entity in another state may not be the right strategy given our state laws. Um, looking within our state um, is a better practice. Um, when we're talking about HIPAA, more often than not, we're talking about the HIPAA privacy rule, but it's also important to know that there's something called the HIPAA security rule, and that's what addresses um, some of the um, things that we need to take into account when we're doing telehealth. Um, both of these um, apply to what is called protected health information, which means individually identifiable health information that's transmitted by electronic media or maintained um, electronically or transmitted or maintained in any other form or medium. That's important because if we're talking about de-identified information, 
neither the HIPAA privacy rule nor the HIPAA security rule apply, and you don't have to put in place all of the rules that we're about to talk about. So that individually identifiable health information is really the crux. Um, the HIPAA privacy rule, this should sound familiar as a general matter, it protects disclosure of uh, protected personal health information. It gen generally requires a written authorization to release information, um, though there are many exceptions that allow you to share information without needing that written um, authorization or permission to release information. Um, who signs that authorization? Well, if the, the minor must sign that if the, if the records in, and information that we're talking about relate to services the minor consented to or could have consented to. So, uh, for example, a minor who is 12 or older has the right in our state to consent to their own um, mental health services if the professional believes that um, they have the capacity to participate meaningfully in mental health care. That would mean that many um, minors age 12 to 18 would sign a release related to disclosure of mental health information. Um, in other cases, it's the parent, guardian, or legal representative who signs. So one of the first questions we get is, well, what does that mean when we're doing electronic um, telehealth and, and doing everything virtually? Can we use electronic signatures uh, for our HIPAA authorization? The HIPAA regulations themselves don't explicitly address this question, um, but what the Federal Department of Health and Human Services said is that the HIPAA rules don't prohibit electronic signatures, and since they don't um, specifically put in place any rules around how to obtain electronic signatures, what you need to do is just follow any state or federal law in terms of practices um, and standards for getting that electronic signature. Um, and so we wanted to just flag two of the sort of core federal rules that come into place anytime we're doing electronic signatures because that would be relevant for anyone who's trying to use electronic signatures on a HIPAA authorization to release. Um, so the first is called the Federal Electronic Signatures in Global and National Commerce Act, the eSign Act. Um, and you wonder who at the federal level spends so much time trying to think of the titles to make it come up with the cute acronyms. That, that is like a job in and of itself. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then the second one is the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act. Um, and those, you know, again, this is something for your agency uh, legal counsel and administration to work together to sort of make sure you understand what all of the different rules are under there. But it, and in general, um, the rules relate to making sure that they uh, legally comply with basic contract law, that there's a way to authenticate who the user is, that, that you actually know that it's Rebecca Gudeman at the other end um, signing that form electronically and that it's not um, her 12-year-old son um, trying to pretend that he's his mom, um, that there is uh, some rules and uh, regulations around ownership and control and message integrity in terms of uh, it when it's being delivered. So again, all, these are all the details are, are not things that folks who are practitioners need to know, but it is important to know that there are some basic rules around how we capture electronic signatures um, that we would need to put you, we would need to honor anytime we're getting electronic signatures, including for an authorization to release information that meets HIPAA requirements. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to say anything about electronic signatures and sort of basic practices under these? Not more than what you've already shared. Okay. Um, okay, so that brings us to the HIPAA security rule. Um, this is something that we don't talk about quite as much, but as a general rule, it protects electronic um, health records, individually identifiable health records, and it requires covered entities, um, health providers, to ensure the integrity of their electronic records. And it does that by requiring you to implement certain administrative, physical, and technical safeguards and, and setting certain standards for you to protect from hackers, et cetera. Um, it's also why, for example, we can't just send health information over our um, Gmail. Um, it puts in place certain standards um, in terms of the kinds of ways that we send electronic information that may include 
confidential health information um, through the ether. Um, now, when uh, the COVID pandemic first started, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services did issue guidance saying that they were going to um, let up on, on many of the security rule um, regulations that made it so that limited um, to a great extent the kinds of platforms we could use to provide telehealth. Um, so it's a much longer document, but I did want to just highlight this one paragraph that says, under this notice, covered healthcare providers may use popular applications that allow for video chats, including Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts, Zoom, or Skype, to provide telehealth without risk that the Office of Civil Rights Enforcement, which is the arm that enforces HIPAA, might seek to impose a penalty for non-compliance. Um, so it goes on from there. But this was really critical because none of those um, applications would have been um, eligible, would have met the HIPAA security rule um, before this guidance came out. Um, now, it is important, as we said, to also take a look at California law. Um, and California law also has some rules around um, integrity and uh, security that are very similar to the security rule. But critically, these were also a part of that Govern Governor Newsom's executive order issued in April. Um, and basically what this uh, executive order says is, as long as you comply with the guidance from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services related to HIPAA, you're good. Um, so that HIPAA guidance from the feds is really what is controlling um, even here in California. Again, this is during the state of emergency. Um, so that gets us to one of the questions that came in um, from a number of you. Does HIPAA allow me to use text, video, or phone to do telehealth? Um, and so I'd like to point you back to that uh, paragraph that says, yes, in fact, you can use video chats, you can use FaceTime, you can use Messenger, um, you can even use Google Hangouts. Um, they will allow you to use all sorts of different platforms um, in a way that we weren't allowed to do before. Um, and then, the, but the follow-up question is, should I use all of these? So um, one of the things that the Fed said was that if you are using one of these platforms that is less secure and that otherwise would not have met the security rule, um, we're encouraging you to notify patients that these third-party applications potentially introduce privacy risks and providers should enable all available encryption and privacy modes when using such applications. Um, now, the, the second bullet you'll see on this slide is from the Business and Professions Code that addresses telehealth. This was what was waived by state law, but I think it is important to remind you that our state law normally requires you to uh, follow all laws and regulations governing professional responsibility and standards of practice um, that you would normally apply. And I mention that because even if certain things are allowed now, again, once the emergency is lifted, this business and professions code goes back into a place. Um, the feds may lift the guidance and uh, Im impose again some of the more stricter rules that we have under the HIPAA security rule. So as you're moving forward, thinking about what you're allowed to do now versus what you may be limited to in the future can be really helpful. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to add anything here? No, um, I don't. I just I, I, I think that uh, it's really important to have informed consent and this this quote at the top. Providers are encouraged to notify patients these third party applications potentially introduce privacy risks and providers should enable all available encryption and privacy modes. Um, you know, it is certainly our recommendation that all of that is happening as it relates to serving students in the schools and their parents or whoever holds uh, the privilege. Thank you. Um, okay, final, um, a, a number of you asked questions about child abuse reporting rules and whether they apply in the same way. Um, our California Child Abuse Reporting Act requires mandated reporters to make a child abuse report whenever the reporter in the scope of their professional capacity 
observes or has knowledge of a child who may be a victim of abuse. If, if they have a reasonable suspicion of abuse, then they must make a report. Um, in some states, your reporting duty is only triggered if you actually physically see someone who directly tells you about abuse. California has a broader application. Simply having knowledge of or observing in some way someone who may um, be a victim of abuse can trigger your child abuse reporting obligation. Um, so you still have an obligation to report abuse if you uh, believe that you have a reasonable suspicion of abuse and uh, even if you're getting that information through a telehealth service. Um, it, you're reporting, if you are a mandated reporter, you are, your mandated reporting duty is only triggered if you obtain that information through the scope of your employment or in your professional capacity. So, to the extent that you're having any kinds of engagements with someone outside of the scope of employment, that, that may mean that you are a voluntary reporter, not a mandated reporter. Um, some folks sort of ask, well, does this change the standard? Um, the standard is if you have a reasonable suspicion of abuse, then you must make a report. And our state law defines reasonable suspicion as um, it being objectively reasonable for a person to entertain a suspicion based on facts that would make anyone else in a similar position um, and, and using the training and experience that you have suspect child abuse or neglect. Um, so, they really want to defer to your discretion and your expertise. So it's sort of two sides of a coin. They don't give you a lot more details about how to do this in the law, but that also means they're really deferring to your expertise. Um, I know we're, later on, we're going to put up some additional resources, particularly around sort of clinical practice. And one of those is a link to a previous webinar in this series on um, behavioral health services. And they do discuss a bit um, child abuse reporting and, and sort of what to look for and identification in that webinar. So we would point you to that. Um, if you want to see a short document that summarizes some of the rules that I was just stating, there is a document on um, telehealth and mandated child abuse reporting on the teenhealthlaw.org website. Um, and you will get um, this slide with the hyperlink later on if you wanna click on it. Um, okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth to talk about FERPA. Okay, so I was going to go, um, uh-oh, is it, am I now controlling the, I don't think I'm controlling the slides now. Uh, not yet, but I can do it for you until we're able to. I can, hear. I'll, I'll try and go ahead and pass the ball um, to Elizabeth. Okay, that'd be great. Well, I will start talking and see if we can. Otherwise, I'll just say, oh, and I'm now the presenter. No. Nope. There we go. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Um, I am not the most technologically savvy person in the world. Um, okay. So we are going to get into FERPA, um, which governs uh, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act and governs um, institu educational institutions and services provided by educational institutions. And FERPA is intended to do two things. It's intended to protect privacy of pupil records, um, and it's also at the same time attended, intended to assure um, parental access to those pupil records. Um, it applies, like I said, to educational institutions and agencies. It can include organizations that contract with or consult with educational agencies if, if we are contracting with them to provide a service for a school district um, then it can cover those organizations um, that are contractors and of course it controls anyone acting for or employed by um, the public schools What's protected? So what are those pupil records, education records that are protected? Um, FERPA says, instead of implementing state law, it's any information directly related to a student, so personally identifiable to a student, maintained by an educational agency or institution, or by a person acting for such agency or institution, 
Um, that, of course, does include students' IEPs, um, their evaluations that have been conducted. Um, there has been a fair amount of litigation over whether um, protocols would have to be released as pupil records if students have filled those protocols out and uh, relatively consistently the decisions have been yes. Um, it of course includes health records like school nursing records um, and other school-based health pupil records um, that are generated. There are some exceptions, oral communications. This is a records law. Um, so oral communications uh, are not <clears throat> included. Records of, and this is an exception specifically carved out in the law, records of instructional supervisory and administrative personnel that are in the sole possession and are not accessible to any other person except a substitute. Um, that would include records that someone is keeping that are not shared with anyone else except for a substitute. Oftentimes when I'm working in the field, someone will say, oh, well, those are personal records, um, but yet they're shared with multiple people for purposes of providing the service to the student. Um, so this exception is narrow um, as it is defined and was written. Um, records of a student that's in a adult, 18 years or older, uh, made by a physician, psychologist, or other health professional that are used only in connection um, with the provision of medical treatment. And there's more information about this um, in the primer on the School Based Health Alliance website. So what's the rule if we have uh, protected records that we're generating, which we do for every student in every district? Um, what is the rule? So FERPA prohibits uh, educational agencies from releasing this personally identifiable information in the record without written consent. Um, and that written consent has to include certain elements to be valid. Now, one of the things that Rebecca and I always talk about when we're doing this training together um, is that we can always share information with identified recipients with a valid written authorization to release the information. And that's why um, while, while we're doing this work out in the field in the schools for students, both of us think that a written authorization to release information, consent to release, um, is, is such a critical component of our practice with children in California. If we do not have a valid written consent to release, then we can only share uh, that information if there is a valid exception and to those that that exception pertains to. Um, the best practice is always to have informed consent to release, and that should really, again, be just embedded in the, the infrastructure and system that you're utilizing to provide services to children. Um, everyone should understand what it is, what forms you're using, um, when you're providing them uh, to students and or parents, depending upon who's providing um, informed consent to treatment, and then, of course, for informed consent to release information. We, again, another sort of challenge I often see is that when I start to work um, in a, like a wellness system for a school district, there is not consensus and or an understanding of what your practices are with relation to obtaining consent and what forms people are going to use um, and what those processes look like. So that, that is really critically important work that needs to happen in the field. So what are the exceptions to sharing information under FERPA? So there is a legitimate educational interest exception, which means that personnel with a legitimate educational interest in that information can have access to it. And that can include contractors and consultants with a district if there is notice in the uh, notice that goes out from the school district that defines those contractors as school officials so that notice goes out into the public. Um, and if those contractors are also complying with FERPA regarding the use and disclosure of information, and that would be incorporated into any contract 
that we had with any provider. Um, so that is, but an interesting discussion often comes up around legitimate educational interests. And I guess I would just say that some people at times feel like if they're an employee, they have a legitimate educational interest in all information pertaining to any child. And that, and that is not the case. There has to be a legitimate reason why the staff person needs access to that information. For instance, there are many staff at a school or in a district that will never have any contact with a student ever at all. Um, and so they would not need access to the pupil records for that particular child. And that's one of the reasons why in our information systems within school districts, we actually do have privacy settings and certain people can see certain pieces of information. It is important um, that we do think through who has a legitimate educational interest in the information, particularly if it's sensitive health information. If there's a health or safety emergency, um, information can be released. Uh, if there's a court order, um, it can be. If there's the child abuse reporting, that mandated reporting exception, um, as Rebecca was just talking about, uh, school employees are mandated reporters, and so we do need to be making those reports. Um, directory information can be released for students, um, which is a very limited amount of information, name, address, um, and some other information, um, but not the details of health records, certainly. And then um, there are some other exceptions, but these are the primary ones that we see coming up in these trainings. Um, there, I just wanted to mention uh, Medicaid and FERPA and the billing um, reference that Rebecca was making. Um, there is uh, guidance out there that says there's no exception to the definition of education record for records used to submit reimbursement claims to Medicaid nor is there any exception to the written consent requirement in FERPA. Therefore, a claim form can only be shared with Medicaid with prior parent consent. And I just wanted to mention that for students with IEPs, that consent is actually embedded in the state IEP form. At the base of the IEP, there's a section that says, I consent to billing for what services um, might be able to be billed for my students. So we just wanted to mention that this is also out there. Who signs the informed consent to release um, parent for students under 18 years old student, if the student is um, 18 or older, if they are 18 or older and an adult, their educational rights transfer to them um, as an adult. Uh, who is parent? How is that defined in the law? It includes a natural parent, a guardian, an individual acting as a parent in the absence of a parent or guardian. A lot of people have been asking about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Acts um, because we have all transitioned to distance instruction um, for students. So I did want to talk a bit about what that is. What is the Child Online Privacy Act? There are actually a number of laws um, that apply and, and would um, be responsive to this question. So I wanted to talk about a couple of them. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act exists in the law. We put the citation in here. And it says that an operator of a commercial website or online service that is targeted to children and or has actual knowledge that is collecting personal information from a child must obtain parental consent before collecting personal information from any child under the age of 13. In addition, we have SOPIPA, which is the Student Online Personal Information Protection Act, um, and that is embedded in the California Business and Professions Code. And that says education technology providers must comply with baseline privacy and security protections such as prohibiting targeted advertising using information acquired from students, protecting the privacy of student records, and prohibiting the sale of student information. So, in, I want to go back to these. When you're 
out working in the field um, as a contractor or a provider um, in the schools. It is important for the administration to ensure that whatever platforms you're using are going to be compliant with these various laws um, with relation to minors in California. And then there are education code privacy protections that are embedded in California law for all of our technology contracts. And that's California Education Code section 49073.1, and it permits LEAs, local education agencies, meaning school districts or county offices of education, um, to enter into contracts with third parties to provide services for digital storage management and retrieval of pupil records and to provide digital educational software that authorizes the provider to access, store, and use pupil records. There are nine minimum contract requirements um, that are embedded in California law with relation to this, um, and they are not limited to, but include um, ownership and control of the records, us maintaining ownership and control of the records, um, obviously, and prohibition against unauthorized use of those records um, and a description of actions that the third party will take to ensure the security and confidentiality of pupil records. So it is important that, um, that the administration be working to ensure that we're complying with all of these different laws when we are executing contracts for uh, provision of, of telehealth and distance instruction to students. Okay, I have five minutes left apparently. Um, so we wanted to talk about informed consent and treatment for telehealth under FERPA and California law. So you want notice to parents of your privacy rules and limitations. You want written notice to students and parents advising them of the privacy limitations of telehealth services, limited expectations of privacy vis-a-vis -vis our ability to monitor online activity or in-home activity. Um, we want to refer to the annual, every parent gets an annual parent notification um, with relation to uh, rules and regulations um, in the school. In addition, it will embed always some information related to technology. For instance, can you take photos of their child? Um, can those be included in the school yearbook? Um, the technology rules for the utilization of technology for the school. Um, and so one place to go and a place where we're doing a lot of work is um, to embed information related to technologies in the parent notification that's provided to all parents. And that can include provisions regarding privacy and expected participant behavior and utilization of technology. It also would definitely include the very clear legal prohibition against recording um, anyone without their consent, any school employee without their consent, um, and the consequences which are also outlined in the law for doing so. Um, consent for IEP telehealth services. Oh, someone was asking if their student has an IEP and there's a consent for a service, is there a new separate consent necessary? We want to get written consent and notice for um, the delivery of telehealth services um, and the limitations of privacy and all of the other information that I was just referencing with relation to uh, telehealth for students. And there is a CASP technology checklist for school telehealth that was issued in April 2020 that is really good um, and I would encourage you to go there for that information. Um, remote consent, how do we obtain remote consent? Um, many of the organizations are using like DocuHub or DocuSign. Um, the consent should be clear in writing. Um, it definitely should go through some sort of protected uh, uh, means through a contract, like I'm talking about, if you're transmitting that electronically. We do already transmit IEPs to parents electronically, um, but you want to be sure that there's encrypted and that you're utilizing a software that is approved by the district. Um, and then you're getting your consent back. And like I said, it could be DocuHub, it could be DocuSign. Um, and you can always use snail mail, although I don't know that anyone uses snail mail anymore, um, but that is always an option. 
best practice for maintaining confidentiality. Um, informed consent to treatment, I just can never emphasize that enough, um, that people know that it's important to maintain confidentiality during sessions, be in a confidential space without distraction or access to others, um, notify a session might be discontinued if there's a breach of confidentiality. Um, parents of our own participants should also be notified there's absolutely no recording without consent, which is why all of this is so important to be provided um, in writing to those we are working with and treating. Um, telehealth, of course, can be provided within a HIPAA or a FERPA governed system. People were asking about text, video, phone. FERPA controls the privacy of records which are generated. So if we are generating records through an electronic medium and we're maintaining those in the regular course of business, and, and they are identifiable to a particular pupil, then those would be pupil records um, that would be subject to FERPA, FERPA and the protections of FERPA. And you, you do want to understand if you're using these electronic mediums, like I said, what records you are generating that will be maintained in the regular course of business that will be pupil records um, and who will have access to those in uh, any given district. Okay, we included some uh, best practice resources um, here. This is, a, I know, a lot of information um, in, a, in a webinar, uh, but hopefully it's been helpful to you all. And I know that the School Based Health Alliance um, is continuing to provide support and resources. And we, uh, we were talking before the webinar, um, are happy to continue to help them do that uh, in any way we can. Here's some more uh, resources that we've incorporated in the webinar. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I only really speak English. <laughs> sadly, sadly. Um, thank you both so much to both of you. That was a lot of content that you got through in a very short time. Um, we did get a number of different questions from folks about how do they get more information. And I'll just say again that we will, the recording of this webinar will be sent out as well as on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org. It's up on the slides right now. Um, we will also send out a link to other websites that can answer some other deeper questions, including the California information that both Rebecca and Elizabeth were part of creating. Um, so there will be opportunity to get to go deeper into the content because as you well know we only had an hour today and it's just so much information to get across. Um, we only have one minute so I'll just ask Rebecca and Elizabeth quickly if they feel like they can answer any of these three questions. Um, I think this is a simple one Rebecca for international students who are minors who can sign the caregiver affidavit if they don't have a qualified relative living here in the U.S. A caregiver consent affidavit can be signed both by a qualified relative, but it also can be signed by someone who's not a relative. Um, and if it is someone who isn't a relative, they can only use it to enroll the young person in school and consent to school related health care. Um, if you need consent for a broader range of health care services, then um, we need to tackle another strategy. And there are other strategies, including getting a legal guardianship. And if someone is an international student who's going to be here for a long time and is in the care of another um, family, um, I would encourage them to talk to someone about the idea of a temporary legal guardianship or some, some of the options available. Great. And then there are some specific questions about am I HIPAA or FERPA, so we will direct those to the, the lovely flowchart on our website that helps you figure out if you are HIPAA or FERPA, because it does vary according to individual situations. So um, we will direct folks back to there. And then there's one last question, um, is nursing statement made at the health center considered educational records? So I, I think that that's probably back to the HIPAA FERPA flowchart, unless that's that's more clear. That's back to the flow chart, depending upon what kind of health center we're talking about. Um, so it could be HIPAA or FERPA, depending. If it's a wellness center, I mean, I could get into more detail, but we don't have time. So I, it's a it's a HIPAA FERPA question that needs to be answered. Who controls the health center? What 
who's, who's it, who are the employees working within the health center, what's the financing for the health center, et cetera. Perfect. So when we send out those slides, we will send out that flowchart by itself as a standalone as well, since that seems to be the root of a lot of folks' questions. And we'll be at the conference talking about yeah. Am I? I, I I'm going to be there. <laughs> I think I just volunteered myself, I think. <laughs> That's the way we like it. <laughs> um, well, thank you again so much to all the participants who were able to join us this morning. We know that you're um, really busy and taking an hour out of your day is a big deal. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, especially to our presenters, Rebecca and Elizabeth, who are amazing and so full of knowledge and trying to disseminate so much information. Um, in a challenging format in a short period of time. Thank you also to Anthem for sponsoring the webinar. Um, please don't forget to do your evaluation. I think Elizabeth has one more yeah. thing. I just have one thing that I want to say. Well, two things, actually. Um, one is I do work for a firm called Atkinson, Andelson, Loya, Red, and Romo, and we have put a, a ton, I mean, maybe 50 since COVID started alerts on our website that are all about all of these issues of contracting and telehealth and teletherapy and what are the laws and what are the confines of what you can and can't do and what should the school districts be thinking about. So I just wanted to, if, if you want to go there, you can get more information. And the other is I just want to say the sincerest thanks to all of you for doing this work. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I did start inadvertently start breaking barriers to get care to children in California and that's you are the ones who are doing that. Um, so I just want to say thanks. Yeah, not checking right now. And their next webinar is actually about self care. So, um, talk about a way of trying to thank yourself for the work that you do. That one will be September 3rd, and that one's on our website as well as conference information. So, stay in touch with us. Let us know what else you need, and um, and check out the website for more information. Thank you all, and have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks.